Michael Burry just predicted the unthinkable. He says that 2022 is going to be like watching a plane crash. Those are his words, not mine. And he's saying that 2022 could play out just like 2008. In other words, the GFC 2.0. I'm going to explain the similarities that I see between today and 2008 in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the Fed's reverse repos and, more importantly, counterparty risk. Let's start with a chart going back to April of 2020, or maybe a little before, and today's date. This is a chart of the Fed's reverse repo transactions, where they are a counterparty. On the left, we go from zero all the way up to $2,000 billion. <laughs> in other words, $2 trillion. I don't know why they do these charts in billions. Why not just simply have a 0.5, a 1, a 1.5, and $2 trillion? Anyway, moving on to the chart, we can see it bump up slightly during the beginning of the Cerveza sickness. It gets up to maybe $250 billion, something like that. And then we go to April of 2021, it goes up slightly, but then it just goes completely parabolic, straight up, just an unbelievable amount. And by the way, you've got to keep in mind, these numbers are daily totals, daily totals. So what this is telling us is that today, right now, as we speak, the Fed is doing two trillion dollars worth of reverse repos every single day. So I'm sure many of you watching this video right now are probably scratching your head, maybe saying, A, what is a reverse repo when the Fed is a counterparty? <laughs> and B, why on earth are we looking at a chart where the reverse repos have gone straight up? This looks very alarming. Well, first of all, the reverse repos is just when the Fed borrows money from a money market fund and gives them collateral such as treasuries in return. And then they swap back the very next day. Usually it's an overnight reverse repo. So O-N-R-R-P is how they indicate it on the Fed's website. And although the Fed is technically borrowing the money from the money market fund, it's a transaction that isn't initiated by the Fed but it's initiated by the money market fund that wants to park the money in the Fed's reverse repo account. So then the next question becomes, why would they want to do it? And why are they doing it to the tune of $2 trillion a day? Well, insert my good buddy, Joseph Wang, who actually used to work at the Fed. He used to run the New York Fed's trading desk, and he is at FedGuy on Twitter. Definitely an amazing person to follow if you want incredible content regarding repo, the Fed's balance sheet, and pretty much everything macro. He believes that going back to 2021, we saw this huge increase. Well, it's not just his belief. That's an actual fact. But the reason he believes that the reverse repo went up at the same time we had this huge increase in M2 money supply was because of banking regulations such as Basel III. And I don't want to go into the detail of these regulations, but basically it restricts the size of the big banks' balance sheets. So if they have a lot of deposits coming in from, let's say, people getting stimmy checks, then this means that they're going to try to offload some of those deposits to try to reduce the size of their balance sheet to stay within the parameters of the regulations set by Basel III. So instead of parking these deposits on their balance sheet, they want to offload them and get them onto someone else's balance sheet, such as the Federal Reserve. Oh, time out. Let's go through the balance sheets of the banks and the Federal Reserve to make sure that we are all on the same page and understand how this process works behind the scenes. So the Fed comes in and does quantitative easing. The government deficit spends like only your drunk, insolvent Uncle Sam can. <laughs> and as a result, 
We have M2 money supply going straight up, going Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond. To infinity and beyond. So this creates more deposits in the commercial banking system in aggregate total. Now let's insert the bank and the Fed and their balance sheets. We've got assets on the left, liabilities on the right. So the bank's balance sheets are expanding. They're growing as a result of M2 money supply increasing. They have more deposits. So what they want to do is take these deposits and put them into a money market fund and then have the money market fund take the deposits and park them at the Federal Reserve. So let's think through what happens to the balance sheets. And when you guys see this process, I think it'll all make sense. The Fed's liabilities are bank reserves, or most of them are bank reserves, but they have separate accounts on the liability side of their balance sheet. They've got the bank reserve accounts for the big banksters like Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, etc. But they also have the reverse repo account itself. So when a money market fund takes these deposits, and moves them over to the Fed, what actually happens is the deposits disappear from the balance sheet of the bank. So this top line is where we start, and after the transaction occurs, the bottom line is where we finish. So to begin with, the bank's assets are bank reserves, liabilities, deposits. But then they say, okay, we want our dollars through the money market fund, to be parked in reverse repo. So these deposits disappear, they're gone. And then what the Fed does is they move the bank reserves, which are the bank's assets, from their account down into the reverse repo account. So the Fed's balance sheet doesn't change at all. They just move the bank reserves that are denominated in dollars, those assets of the bank, from their account down to reverse repo. And then the bank no longer has those bank reserves, but they no longer have the deposits. So effectively, their balance sheet shrinks, and this is their objective. So now we understand how these big banks are utilizing the Fed's reverse repo account in order to reduce the size of their balance sheet to stay within these regulations created by Basel III. But I also want to point out that this is creating, as always, massive unintended consequences. The central planners, the politicians, the central bankers come in and think that they can micromanage everything and they can improve it. But inevitably what happens is they just make things worse. They end up causing more problems than they were trying to solve in the first place. But I'm gonna save that for a completely separate video. <laughs> So I guess the question then becomes, okay, George, we see what Joseph Wang is talking about. It makes a lot of sense. How is this similar to 2008? Well, if we go back to 2008 in Lehman Brothers, as an example, why did they go bust? Because they couldn't get dollar liquidity. They couldn't access the repo market. Why? Because people saw the collateral on their balance sheet and one day it was pristine, the next day it's garbage, meaning mortgage-backed securities. And then they looked at Lehman Brothers themselves and said, no, 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 we're not going to lend to you because based on the collateral you have, there's too much counterparty risk. So fast forward to 2022, and let's go back to this chart of reverse repo or the amount of cash that money market funds are parking at the Fed going parabolic up to $2 trillion per day. I believe that now this could be more so a result of perceived counterparty risk than it is Basel III. Why do I say that? Because if we go ahead and pull up a chart of M2 money supply, we can see that it's actually leveled off and recently it's gone down. So the deposits are decreasing in the banking system in aggregate total, yet we see reverse repo continuing to go up to all time highs. 
So why would these money market fund managers continue to have the dollars they're responsible for parked at the Fed instead of a commercial bank? Well, it goes back to counterparty risk. If they think the banks are about to fail, or if they think the banks are becoming more and more risky because, I don't know, maybe we're going into a recession. Maybe they see an economic collapse. Maybe they see a stock market crash or the prices in the housing market going down, reducing equity, creating some sort of systemic risk. So the more risk they see in the system, the more incentivized they would be to take those dollars they're responsible for out of the bank and park them at the Fed. Because once they're at the Fed, there is zero risk because the Fed can't go bust. A commercial bank like Lehman Brothers can. Step number two, the first similarity I see between today and 2008 is accelerated perceived counterparty risk in the banking system. The second is market hysteria. We see this all over the place, or at least we were seeing it until November of 2021 when the Fed announced they're going to start raising rates and potentially reducing the size of their balance sheet, meaning quantitative tightening that should be coming up here right around June of 2022. But to illustrate market hysteria, to get a picture of what it looks like, let's look at this chart. And this is the psychology of a bubble. We go from stealth mode to awareness to mania to blow off. A blow off top, I'm sure you've heard that term many times. And this is the valuation of the price of XYZ asset going up. So it starts off going up slightly until we get midway to the awareness stage. And then we get the first sell off. And this is kind of a bear trap. But then the media picks it up, starts talking about it. Then the general public gets enthusiastic, the retail investor. Then they start to get greedy. Then they get delusional. Then we hear in the mainstream media that this is a new paradigm that everything has changed, and this time it's different. But we all know how that story ends. <laughs> it starts to go back down, then the market participants, especially the bulls, are in denial. They start to buy again, and then the bulls are claiming that we're going to return back to normal, we're going to get back up to the price, and we're going to exceed it, but the selling continues. Then fear starts to set in with the retail investor, then capitulation, which basically means everyone is selling. No one wants anything to do with this asset. Then we go into this despair mode where most of these people buying up here have lost everything. And then we start the process over again where the smart money comes back in and they start to buy again. So once we understand how this process works and what it looks like, let's compare it to some of the things that we saw prior to 2008 and some of the things that we are seeing today. Let's start by looking at a chart of the housing market from let's say 1996 to 2006 or 2007. Editor, go ahead and throw up both these charts so the viewer can contrast the two, and you'll see they're almost identical. But now let's move on to a chart of housing from 2012 to today, or maybe the end of 2021. And once again, you can see the similarities. Although today we might not be at the new paradigm, but we're definitely in the greed or the delusion stage. And now that we're discussing the housing market, want to give a quick teaser on step number three. We're going to be discussing mortgage-backed securities, the same mortgage-backed securities that blew up the entire market and the economy during the last GFC. I think we could see a repeat of that in 2022. So make sure you watch this entire video. Now let's move on to a chart of the total market cap of cryptocurrency. And you can see the exact same thing playing out. And then finally, we go to a chart of Kathy Wood's fund called ARK, A-R-K-K. -K. 
And what's interesting about this is you could hear or see Kathy Wood in the mainstream media constantly saying these exact same things. It's a new paradigm. We're moving into a completely different economy driven by technology. Again, this time it's different. The exact same thing we heard in the dot-com bust in the late 1990s. And you can see her, her fund is down significantly. In fact, it looks identical to this chart. But what is she doing? She is still in the denial phase where she's saying that her fund is going to go right back to where it was before and exceed the prior valuations, exceed the prior price. That at the end of the day, she's going to be right. And she's gone so far as to say that her fund is going to have 30, 40, 50% returns over the next few years. There are no certainties. There are only probabilities. But I think the probability is very high that right now with Kathy Wood's fund, we are somewhere in this area, probably a lot more downside to go. But it'll be interesting to see how this plays out through the rest of 2022 when the Fed is explicitly trying to bring down asset prices to control the rate of inflation. And if they do this by continuing to raise interest rates, this is going to put a lot more pressure on Kathy Wood's ARC fund. So a lot of you right now are probably looking at this and saying, okay, George, I get it. There are definitely similarities between this visual chart of how the psychology of a bubble works and these assets. And well, especially with ARC, the last one we went over, it's identical, eerily identical to this chart. But maybe most of the downside has already occurred. Maybe it's time to start buying again. Well, editor, let's go ahead and throw up more charts of what the NASDAQ looks like and the S&P 500. You'll see similarities, but instead of us being in the fear or the capitulation phase, right now, we're most likely in the bull trap phase. And this is what Michael Burry is referring to when he goes out on Twitter and he says that today, the meme stocks, cryptocurrencies, and the housing market reminds him a lot of 2008, just prior to the last GFC. The big difference that I would add that makes this even more scary is back then, we were just dealing with a housing market bubble. Today, we're dealing with the everything bubble. Step number three, mortgage-backed securities again. <laughs> and if you're wondering, it is definitely stiff drink time. So pour yourself that stiff drink, sit down, buckle up, because this, unfortunately, is going to get scary. So we've got Jerome Powell right here, obviously, and he is pointing to the fact that he wants treasuries only on the Fed's balance sheet. He has said this numerous times, that they really want to get out of the business of buying mortgage-backed securities. And he's also said that they're going to start quantitative tightening in June. So this means that they're actually selling the assets on their balance sheet, shrinking their balance sheet. So there is a significant probability that they start by selling those mortgage-backed securities. So if the Fed stops buying them, which they have because they've taken their QE program down to zero. So technically over the last, let's call it few months or at least since November, the Fed has reduced its buying down to zero. So maybe over the last couple months, technically, they haven't bought any mortgage-backed securities. So what has happened to the mortgage rates during this time? Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart. And we can see that the mortgage rates have gone sky high. Now, a lot of you may be saying, George, okay, well, there is a reason for that because the Fed has been raising interest rates. They've taken rates from zero to, let's say, 75 basis points, a range between 75 and 1%. But look at how much mortgage rates have gone up compared to Fed funds. 
the rates have gone up significantly more, let's say from 3% to 5%, where the overnight rate that Jerome Powell sets has only gone up by 75 basis points. Why is this? Because now that these mortgages or mortgage-backed securities are going onto the balance sheet of the private sector, they care about profit, where the Fed doesn't. The Fed will buy at any price, where the market says, hmm, if I'm going to take this mortgage or mortgage-backed security onto my balance sheet, I am going to require a risk premium for future inflation expectations because I'm buying an income stream that's denominated in dollars. So if in the future these dollars are worth less, or maybe even worthless, <laughs> whichever way you want to look at it, I require a higher interest rate. In other words, the price goes down. But before we move on, I want to point out a key difference between mortgage-backed securities and T-bills. When the Fed starts selling treasuries, there's most likely going to be a bid. Those prices aren't going to plummet. The interest rates aren't going to spike higher. Why? Because the market needs these T-bills for dollar liquidity, like in the repo market. So they, the market sees these T-bills as pristine collateral. They do not see mortgage-backed securities as pristine collateral. Therefore, instead of having two groups that want to buy the asset, and the two groups, I mean the people that want to hold T-bills and the people that want to buy those T-bills to use them as collateral. With mortgage-backed securities, you only have one group providing that market demand. And that's the group that actually wants to keep these mortgage-backed securities on their balance sheet as an investment. I think the easiest way to look at this is there are multiple reasons for market participants to buy T-bills. There is only one reason for them to buy mortgage-backed securities. And that one reason is heavily driven by supply demand, risk, and future inflation expectations. Now let's go over a visual of how this works in practice. So the average Joe goes into a bank and he wants to borrow money. He wants a loan to buy a house. So the bank says, okay, average Joe, you're credit worthy. You're worth the risk. So we'll go ahead and give you, let's say $500,000. That $500,000 is brand new currency, brand new dollars. It didn't exist before. That becomes a deposit for Joe. It's a liability on the bank's balance sheet. Well, the offsetting asset would be the mortgage that was just created, the loan. But what happens when the Fed does quantitative easing is they'll go ahead and buy the mortgage or what turns into a mortgage-backed security. It goes through Fannie and Freddie and it becomes a what I call a mortgage-backed sausage because they just kind of lump them all together and it, they spit it out the other side and it becomes an investment product. <laughs> so anyway, the Fed balance sheet starts with nothing in this example. So when the Fed buys the mortgage, or we'll say the mortgage-backed securities from the bank, what happens is they are increasing demand and they are decreasing existing supply for the rest of the banks or pension funds who actually want to hold these mortgages on their balance sheet in the form of mortgage-backed securities or mortgage-backed sausages, whichever you prefer. <laughs> So after the transactions, the mortgage-backed securities are an asset on the Fed's balance sheet, and they pay for those with newly created bank reserves, funny money, out of thin air. So then the bank still has that deposit as a liability, but now the offsetting asset is the bank reserves that they traded for the mortgage-backed securities. Now let's think through the next step. What happens when this process is reversed? And instead of buying, the Fed starts selling through the process of quantitative tightening that Jerome Powell is telling us he's going to start in June or sometime around June. So when the Fed sells, those mortgage-backed securities go right back to the balance sheet of the bank and they use those bank reserves that were their asset that they had at the Fed to buy the mortgage-backed securities 
So their balance sheet goes pretty much right back to where it was at the beginning, and so does the Fed. But there's more to the story. What ends up happening is this creates more supply of the mortgage-backed securities and lowers demand. Therefore, if rates went down here, rates would naturally go up a lot higher when the process is reversed, meaning when they go from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. Oh, but wait, there is more. What happens is the average Joe and Jane, while this process is occurring, is still taking out mortgages to buy homes in aggregate total. The demand may be going down, but it doesn't go to zero. So when the bank initiates these new loans, creates these new mortgages, they know that they're going to have to sell them to Fannie and Freddie. Well, they have to initiate or execute the mortgage at a lower price than they can sell it to the marketplace or Fannie and Freddie or the pension fund that ends up buying the mortgage-backed security. And as you guys know from watching my videos, the interest rate and the price have an inverse relation. So if the price goes down, the interest rate that they're charging goes up. So if the Fed is unloading all these mortgage-backed securities they have on their balance sheet, this is going to increase the supply, reduce demand, means price goes down, interest rates go up, while at the exact same time, the new mortgages that are being produced are having to compete with the price of the existing mortgages that are circulating within the marketplace. Well, if the price of those mortgages that are existing, that are circulating, goes down because of what the Fed is doing, the interest rates skyrocket, therefore the interest rates of the new mortgages will also have to skyrocket to compete with the existing supply. If mortgage rates spike in this scenario that I'm explaining, just like the repo rates spike in September of 2019, you could see this put massive downward pressure on home prices, very similar to what we saw in 2008 during the GFC. I wanna be very clear, I'm not predicting a real estate crash. Real estate prices don't go down quickly. It takes a long time for them to go from peak to trough. But what I am saying is these three things, the increased perceived counterparty risk, market hysteria, and a big, big potential problem with mortgage-backed securities are very similar today to what they were back in 2008. And this is something that needs to be on all of our radar screens. Because if Michael Burry is correct and the unthinkable does happen, you want to be prepared. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. I will see you on the next video.